Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this virtual book party with Sandra Tsinglo and Henry Alford. I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block. Uh, this program marks the end of our 24th season. So stay tuned for next season, which will launch soon and we'll keep you posted um, about what's coming up. I urge you to buy Sandra's new book, The Mad Woman and the Roomba. This book is different from her other books. It's wildly funny, but with serious undertones and revelatory moments about how she lives and thinks about her domestic life, her career, and her extended family. Her stories reflect her everyday experiences on her maddeningly but wonderful rational partner, Charlie, and her daughters who are set to launch. And we hang on every word as she walks a balance beam from the ridiculous to the sublime, from the quotidian to the profound. She turns Los Angeles into a nuanced, if unwitting character itself, as she contemplates class, achievement, old friends, you name it. Her descriptions of places and activities we think we know make us laugh very loud but there's a lot to it. It's emotional and weighty and it's terrific. Here to lead Sandra into domestic mayhem is humorist Henry Alfred. You've read him in the New York Times in Vanity Fair and his books have won him prizes. While The Big Kiss, his book about making it as an actor won a Thurber Prize for humor. I really love his book, Would It Kill You to Stop Doing That? A Modern Guide to Manners. And I should read it more often. So Henry and Sandra will chat. When they're through, Henry will ask Sandra some questions that some viewers have sent in. I'm so delighted to introduce Sandra Tsing Lo and Henry Alfred, and I want you all to buy Sandra's book because it's so good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Oh my God. Right? And scene. And scene. <laughs> End of Zoom. Zoom is over. <laughs> Shut it down. <laughs> oh my God. Well, can I say before we begin, yes. if you're sitting in one of my favorite places in the world, which is your home, I shan't say the address, but for many years, I had the keys to your apartment. You and did. I still have them. You so may. So we are sort of born two days apart. We're sort of bi-coastal, you know, siblings. And Kindred I believe, spirits. I believe you're sitting in a room near a room of books that is the most fantastic room of books, that your books are actually in order of authors and you can sit in that room or it's oh, right yes there are there are many books yeah, many can you, can books you, okay. so look at this so if you sit in henry's room you can it's like you can just start reading the books because they're all the ones collected that you would like oh wow yeah. and thank i found you. that very much and sort of thank when you the, the Thurber how project, you how you flatter my, my book buying skills. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is really kind of that journey through all the humorists. Like I do, I have, a, I have a huge collection of humorous books and all of your books are there. Um, so thank you. Thank you for furnishing my home. Let me see if I can do this with my computer. This will go much more terribly. So uh, see, those are my books there. <laughs> It's, it's just, we have a home that has no bookshelves, so that's what's happening. Yeah, right. Books it's well. a more relaxed attitude toward it is. Or... <laughs> it's the yes. West Coast. <laughs> it's the West Coast, yes. Um, well, you know, I would uh, repeat every single thing that Andrea said. I totally agree with her. I think that this book is as funny as all your other books, but I think what's different is there is a there's there's a seriousness that I want to talk about later but I think first of all we should talk about this idea that you my dear have enjoyed the great distinction of writing a work of domestic humor that has been published not only during a global <laughs> health crisis but whose publication date was on blackout tuesday <laughs> yes uh, thank you. How's Henry. that going for you? Yeah, uh, that's a, that's the ideal softball question, isn't <laughs> it? Um, you know what? It is okay. So I'm going to say back when. I mean, there is a place. There, I believe there's always a place for um, 
humor uh, of our domestic lives, et cetera. And it's never in any news cycle. It's always what when newspapers go, okay, I, I guess we have a lull. So, we, <laughs> like, so you know, as humorists, right, we're always finding the, like, in, in Big Kiss, do you say, like, find the hole? Was that the phrase? Yeah. Like, find the hole. It's like, we're, all, we're always working around the more important things that are happening in the world. And this, I turned this book in about two years late, because it was supposed to be kind of domestic humor about our, the ridiculousness of our daily lives, as you can tell by my incredibly messy house and my massage chair. Um, and, 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 and so the election came, I, I happen to be a Democrat um, and a menopausal woman of a certain age, menopausal. So, so it, it kind of threw me back of like, how do we deal with this big moment? And then we edit, ended up editing out those parts that made it of 2017. It was sort of that year of 2016, 2017, to make it more just kind of like universal of what are the things that we live. So, so sort of in my preface, I go, and I know the world has seemed surreal and apocryphal lately, <laughs> written in 2018. <laughs> no, but let's take a moment and sit in the <laughs> massage chair and just contemplate our lives. We had no idea how surreal that things were gonna get beyond that and how fraught all these questions would be as they should be fraught in this particular time. So it's been an interesting sort of, shall I say counter programming? Because I, I think that while people deal with the 24 seven news cycle and, and trying to show up as citizens in this world, there's also a bit of exhaustion and fire can come and say, hello, hey right. fire. You want to say it like, okay, this is kind of a cameo moment. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, very yeah. unusual, would never happen. So yes. Here is, he's gonna, so here is my partner, Charlie, who's in the book, in his goddess pants. <laughs> You're actually live on the writer's block. And I'm so happy to see you, man. It's been way too long. Yeah, it's great to see you. Hello. Now, look, here, can you see? I know we're live. Um, these are the goddess pants. I'm wearing them too, my friend. Oh. <laughs> 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 Why would you not be wearing it? Yes, exactly. Right. These are the best pants. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Buy a book, get some pants. Okay. Lovely to see you, Matt. Yeah. yeah this you is too. great. Fantastic. So professional. But I think it's a bit of color that we wouldn't get ordinary. Oh, absolutely. So, and we just had a shot with you, Fryer, and the massage chair. I, I know. I mean, and that's it. like the entire book right there <laughs> in one. Again. And scene. This is going <laughs> so amazingly well. But but I think that's and, and I think that you I mean, your work, um, I'm, I'm going to pivot for a moment. It's like, I, I first, you know, was reading you in Spy in the 80s and 90s in such a different time where we'd have Ivana Rama on the cover and that was a parody. <laughs> like, yeah, like, right. Now. So, but I think there's always a time uh, for humor to comment, even though we, we do it when, when the national story is so overwhelming. But I, but I think there's a bit of respite for a moment, uh, you know, I have teens and they're revolutionaries and revolutionaries need to eat and show up in relatively clean underwear, as I like to say. So that's what we're maintaining. So, so thus my answer to your question. Yeah, and, and, and as it's sh shaken out, you've had to um, do curbs, you're doing curbside um, <laughs> so, autographing of copies of the book. Thank you. Thank you, because I have found in this particular time, and I deal with theater and arts organizations and bookstores and whatnot, that, that this particular quarantine pandemic time has made us go to the old performance art things. And I began as a performance artist, as you well know, um, like doing piano concerts on the Harbor Freeway and doing that kind of living theater stuff. Well, we're right. sort of going back to that now in this time of hand-to-hand -hand connection. There isn't an Instagram hashtag that is gonna solve any of this for us. So I go, okay, instead of going in a bookstore, oh, my entire book tour was canceled, of course. I was like, I'm going to a bookstore. I feel lucky enough. And it was like just one by one, like death by a thousand paper cuts. Um, and so I go, I can't really give a, a bookstore thing. So I go, well, so we're in phase two in California. I could do like an autographed, book with COVID safe curbside pickup out of my garage. So, and the great thing for a book author, as you know, Henry, like as we, uh, you know, it's kind of like, 
he may sell more books than me, but I would consider myself a mid-list book author. <laughs> We're not, like, I am not selling, you know, kind of like, you know, the, like, I'm kind of, yeah. So I'm at a, where I can go, okay, so I can have, if I have a Saturday afternoon, one to four, they have to be COVID safe. If, if there's one person every half hour, and they're, that's safe. That's COVID yeah. safe. So I can say it's worth it. safety. And yes. so we sit on folding chairs in the backyard and people drive from like 60 miles away because they're so bored and they have no destination. And it's been a really sweet time. Hooray. No, I so admire your ingenuity. And that's exactly what someone with a book out right now should be doing. So, but, but I think it's also kind of like we began as like writers to make a people to people connection and without going you know, deeply into the book publishing industry is kind of like, well, tweet to your 20 million people and they like it, whatever. In a way, I'm finding this kind of a, a sweet time of like going back to just a very one-on-one -on -one thing um, that's, that's been really nice. Yeah, no, and as you say, people, I think people really want that right at this moment. So, um, no, so I think potentially, yeah, th this book could be a, re a real bomb for people. Um, so, my favorite part of the book is the JJ storyline. Oh! Uh, that was heartrending. So just, I'll set it up a little bit. So Sandra's younger daughter is a huge fan of the Homestuck books. There's an online community for people who read these books. The daughter befriends a young, gay, suicidal, question mark, kid? And you, you, what happens? So, uh, I, right, so this is online. So part of this book is like, you know, remember the Tiger Mom book and that was very successful and she's a successful parent. This is the Panda Mom <laughs> book of somebody just like every single thing wrong. Everything is wrong. So it, because we have kids that like, uh, yes, yeah, so it, this uh, story and, the, and the, the, my daughter had befriended this person online, but they only texted in the way that teens do. So there was never a phone call or a video phone call or anything. So we didn't know if it might be like a catfish or something. And, and apparently, I'll just say in part of this journey, there's a thing of, of teenage girls, 12 to 14, befriending suicidal gay, gay young men. As opposed to our relationship, which is so perfect. <laughs> We're kind of like, like, it's like, but so, but I think with teens, and if you're a parent, it's, it's like you hope the journey will be that your kid comes to dinner, home for dinner and says, you know, I got an A plus in kind of world history and I, you know, won the varsity swimming team championship or whatever, but they're really deeply invested in their friends. Um, and 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 in in ways that you can't even quite follow. Of my best um, at one point, doesn't he gives her a he makes her a little gift box that has a farting unicorn on it. It's, it was the most precious and amazing. So the thing is, it is kind of like both. Uh, I'm depressed on Tuesday. This is my day of my meds. And then the next day in the mail comes the most beautiful like handmade artwork. And then I got on the phone because she would be tired of texting him and she would just want to like, I want to do my homework. So it was like the and there, were and there were texts about that he was hiding in his closet sometimes. Because totally with his father. With because his, his uncle beat right, him. Right, who, who didn't want, it was homophobic. And it's kind of like, I'm afraid. And I go, well, just text us your address and we'll send the police. No, I can't. So it was like, you were just put in this impossible situation all the time of where I'm going, I want to protect you, my child, I want to protect your friend, and I can't. And to a certain extent, teens are, let's say, kind of like, sometimes they say one thing, sometimes they say another. So it put us in a frenzy for a long time. And then sometimes I would pick up the phone and text, which is the worst boundary breaking thing of like, of like, I, I, I everything, I went to a therapist, who's a great therapist, and everything she said, I didn't do. <laughs> I go, okay, first of all, you're invested in being the cool mom, get out. I go, I'm not the cool mom, but I didn't get out. Uh, and so cut off all communication, they can, you don't. And then my daughter kept saying, we gotta go to Florida. We gotta go to Florida to visit him. Um, 
you know, before he commits suicide. And then yeah. Does, wow. Then let's In- visit his tombstone. It's like, uh, so I did. So we did go to Florida. Yeah, like, okay. and maybe let's not reveal the ending because I think, yeah, let's save it for readers because it is quite delightful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I think that's part of the thing of, of parenting of this kind of year of a life in a family of like, you can't, you can't really control it. I mean, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't show up and try, but I found as a parent, like there were so many questions where I go, I, I can't answer that. Well, you had a kitten and it ran out in the street and it became a horrible splat and you saw it on the way home. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> like, and that's terrible, like, ah! You know, so there, there's a lot of that that happened. On it, but, but I think they're, they're not giant tragedies, but they're kind of stuff that's experienced in a household in a year. Yeah, no, and that's, and as you say, that's what makes the book such an interesting um, sort of antidote to commonly held ideas about what's going to happen to you after 50 that life after 50 is not about his and her uh soaking tubs and it's not about having a, a an argyle sweater knotted attractively around your neck and holding hands and walking off into the sunset with your partner right. no it's much more like your daughter is friends with a possibly suicidal gay possible. I mean, who knows who, who that guy was? Like, it, that could have been a 60 year old man, just. Um, right, and the thing is there isn't, even when people tell these stories, there's an easy way of like, well, surely you did this or that or the other. But when you're faced with actual family members and especially children who are so interesting, like my kid, was very intense and smart and uh, consistent. And it was like, it's like, we are gonna go visit him. And it was like every week for three months, three or four months, we are gonna go visit. So so kind of knew her own mind in a certain way. I mean, you, you and then you can lens back 10 or 20, 30 years, but it's, it's like, these aren't really easy if you are sort of in a relationship with these people, I guess I would say, these people. I yeah. Think. These people, um, right, them. But the um, Argyle sweater, I'm still fixated on that. That's yeah, really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you seem to be pulling it off. Like, look at you. Like. <laughs> um, well, one, one of the questions from the audience, uh, and, and I guess from me too, is when you're, deal, when you're writing that kind of super personal material, are you, uh, at what point did you tell your daughter, hey, this storyline intrigues me. Do you mind if I write about it? Did you, did you wait until after everything? Or did you do it very early on? Did you let her read it, et cetera, et cetera? So happily, I guess my children, that when they were born, they were, I was 38 and 40, I was performing at theater, like, an, like uh, kind of push them through airports and like a double stroller. So they've sort of been on the road. They know their mother writes. To my knowledge, they haven't read anything I've ever written. <laughs> and they're not super interested. They're not uninterested. They're supportive, but it's a little bit like a gypsy family and their mother, uh, their father is a musician who travels. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like, well, they know the Cirque du Soleil thing. So it's not, they're sort of not of that culture thus far of reading what I write. Um, and I would say, uh, yeah, as I go into tween teens, I can see more and more of their lives. It's kind of like mitts off. This, is, this has been the sweet spot for 25 years. And I've been able to write about my dad who kind of loved being covered uh, and I think, but I, I can see, uh, okay, so this is, and I think that Florida story with JJ is, is definitely this, this tipping point, I changed a lot of the details and it's my version of this and that child would tell another version of that. So we kind of, it, it kind of tries to, but, but I think that that's definitely in the, in the gray area there. But then other things, like I would say, like uh, you were in fifth grade and the states were assigned and you got Hawaii. And that seemed amazing, <laughs> like, like that's sort of a generic family story of kind of like, 
So Henry, do you, did you get a state when you were in fourth grade? Did you feel I, like? I don't think we did that. I think social studies, we were, we were doing like, um, uh, you know, Indonesia, what, what is there? Oh my, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's nice. That, yeah, which you is, didn't get this straight. You didn't get like, uh, you know, Wisconsin or something. So we, no. always, yeah. So no, anyway. I think I got Jakarta. Or <laughs> <laughs> were, can I ask, were you a procrastinator? Uh, as a kid, uh, I, I was honing, honing that skill. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was nascent. It was growing. Um, it took, um, yeah, it took, an, I think you have to have a, a job before you can really, okay. yeah, Very get that going. Because the college procrastination, you know, that's for amateurs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, well, okay. So that, as per your question, that is kind of like, I, I think as it gets older, I got to back off on their stories now. Yeah, right. No, that seems, that seems right. And I think that as, as your subjects get older, I mean, obviously your father totally ate it up. He loved being written about. Same thing with my, the first time I wrote about my mother, uh, she, uh, what did she say? Oh, well, okay. So it was a story called how to tell the difference between your mother and your dog. Um, and <laughs> she looked at it and she said, cute, you know, just one <laughs> word. And then I did something, some other one, very short. And at the, after that one, she said, maybe you could get a travel magazine to send us somewhere. <laughs> so... So you don't want to create a monster, is what I'm saying. Well, well, um, unless it's useful because they're <laughs> going off and yeah, yeah, and they don't have, yeah, no, I think the, our parents are definitely these characters. Yeah, we can well, and so that's the other, for me, the other incredibly lovely and, and really poignant part of your book, of course, is, is your, your dad dying. And, and you've written about him a lot. Um, we adore Mr. Lowe, the occasion. In your book, you, you, ha yeah, in your book about the, the older people, it's kind of right. like, yes. remind so, me of it, like, I'm, I'm getting How to live, things. yes. How to and live, I, oh my God. So yeah, cause, stories. because I, I interpret a lot of his um, eccentricities as, as wisdom. Um, uh, <laughs> Thank as you. A, oh, <laughs> I'm like going to light my Mr. Lowe. There you did, is. and he would be delighted with that. And, and reading in your book, it did seem like wisdom, the way, it didn't seem like it to me when I heard it, but when I read it in your book. Well, yeah, I mean, even something as simple as him peeing on his lawn, which he did right away in, for me as soon as I met him at his house. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, that's e ecologically smart. He's, he's thinking ahead, um, thinking of the future. Um, you were very unfazed by the father. You were very unfazed. But I remember in your VH1 show, when you would interview like bikers or whatever, you are, you are incredibly unfazed. And that, that's something that people don't know about you. When You're they read kind. about your work, like Municipal Bondage way back, which is it. I, okay, it's in my bathroom and that is a compliment. Sorry. <laughs> that is a compliment. So, um, You're so he was, so your dad was 97 at this point, so it, it it weren't no surprise. No. Certainly. It was kind of a blessing in an odd way because he had had Parkinson's. His care was very costly. He was, you know, and um, yeah, it was, it was kind of like, and, and, you know, I was thinking like, was it a good year? Was it a bad year? It was a good year because someone died and it was the 97 year old guy. So, you know, right? And like, this happened in the proper order. When in our, our hideous world, such as this, does somebody, it goes in the proper order. And the 97 year old guy uh, goes. I mean, it's weird when they finally do go, it's very visceral when they do, but, and it's more the memories of, et cetera, et cetera. But, but yeah. Um, and what a gorgeous 
funeral you had for him in your backyard where the band who had written a song about him being a, a naked swimmer and an occasional hijacker, or not <laughs> a, a hitchhiker, yeah. not hijacker. No, no it's it a Malibu grunge band, Boy Hits Car, who had written an ode to him, and it was a This American, and I turned it into a This American Life story, thus thanking my father again for being material. And they, he was the, like, Da, 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 da. he's the naked handstand man so ever since they were boys they were singing about him and he was just this colorful character in the, na the neighborhood to them yeah to us, he was not colorful and you just do your algebra and calculus and go to bed early but this is the way of eccentric parents so now obviously an event like that it just happened and it it was it's a perfect ending for the book but for the rest of the book were you, did you, did you plot stuff out? Did you think, um, you know, I want, I hear this JJ arc is, is kind of moving. I'm going to put it about two thirds of the way through because that's where I want people to be moved. How did you architect? Yes. I love that question. I love you for, this is my favorite question. How did you architect? And I was looking around briefly because I did have a cardboard, like a, board where I mapped it out. So oh. as you know, Henry, we are both humorous. We both began in magazines with the short form. And where as we as we ripen, not as we age, as we ripen, where you go, uh, so I first put this collection together because it was supposed to be like short humor pieces. And it's kind of like, and then I remember I have I put together a lot. So I was like, I have three or 400 pages. I'm basically done. And I sat on my front porch and I read it and I started to have a nervous breakdown about like 60 pages. Cause I go, oh, this has the same rhythm. Ha ha bleh, ha ha bleh. And there's no evolution. I do want it to be a year in, in, in the life. So I did, I knew that JJ's story was the kind of the, one of the, mo the most important story I could write. And I hadn't um, written it as a funny short piece anywhere because it's kind of a weird, it doesn't fit into the short humor story. So I thought that that should happen. It happened in summer. So if you plot it out about two thirds of the way to three quarters of the way. So it's kind of like it first goes for the first half. And then, because I was like about halfway through, there's the first paragraph and it's the end of, so it begins with January goes to December begins a June graduation of my nephew, who it's not really a spoiler alert, but my wonderful nephew applies to college on page one and gets shut out entirely. Doesn't get in anywhere, which is kind of the underlying kind of like thing of the, the worry about getting into college. So halfway through, at it, it's the first inkling of this emotional moment of uh, graduations being happy and sad at the same time and then it iterates and then August is really bad and then Thanksgiving of November is kind of like where you see oh my god the light is darkening and blah, and then it ends with this way so so yeah I, I did thank you for asking that and I did I did try to kind of map it out so there's a little bit more emotion that comes in the second half and then it lands kind of where it began yeah no perfect and and, and it has a real flow um, I, I was just talking with a screenwriter who kept referring to the all is lost moment. And yes. Yeah. So in the yes. 90 minute movie, that's what 60 minutes in. That's where, yes, our hero is flat on his or her face. Yeah. And, and the world has gone to shit. And then like phoenix from the ashes well yeah. i think that's i think that's totally right and i think the structure of the book i think because i cut out a little this this gets a little slow going and i was talking to my friend dan axed uh, who you also know who is the inspiration for a character that philip andrews and we've discussed it we're fine with it we vetted it legally <laughs> out where sort of the stanford swimming episode like the battle is like i go he goes, okay, what's the part where I'm in? I go, it's the Stanford swimming. He goes, I'm going to read that first. I go, well, just read the rest first, because that's actually the inciting incident. That's like where you're going like Peter and the Wolf. Dun, 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 dun. Everything seems fine until, because my nephew applied to Stanford, his mother got a salary, where you have the first dinner and you realize that early admittances are coming into Stanford and someone's getting in. You have heard nothing 
about the other kid. So that like so the inciting incident comes a little later than it should in a movie. In a movie, it should be kind of like eh, I don't know, eight to fifteen pages, and it's twenty-five. So it is there is kind of a movie thing, and then the the halfway moment. Henry, I think you would say this where where the hero was the hero. I think he's the hero. Page sixty, where you're standing on one foot on the dock and one on the boat. Do you remember yes. that part? Right. Yeah. So should I stay or should I go? Right. And and then the great kind of construction for all stories is the hero goes into the forest to slay the dragon. Halfway there, he realizes back home, his village is burning. As, as we would say in inside the actor's studio. <laughs> Thank you, James. <laughs> How fun. Well, let's look at some of the questions that um, people sent in. Okay, here's one. Charlie is a great character. After living with you for a long time, he must know that everything he says is fodder for the next book. Does he walk around saying, this is off the record, or does he not mess with your reporting? Oh, what a question. Well, he is he is very tolerant. He's very tolerant and he is eccentric as you've seen because he has come on screen and visited. So to a certain extent, um, he, In the book, don't you, you describe him as um, that he's, uh, uh, he's best suited to be the affable Duke of a small Belgian province. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. Now, Henry, you're a wasp. I believe. <laughs> I look into the camera I see uh, all the, yeah, I, I, although your, your country was Jakarta, yeah. I see a lot. <laughs> so part of this tale to lens back, and that's a great question, and it's not like I am evading it, but I will take a larger look. So this, this is like a story about like gentle downward mobility. It's, it's a glide, it's a glide. So my father was the Chinese immigrant. I'm half Chinese, one of the liberal arts, which to a Chinese father is like pole dancing. TM joke used so many times over the years. Um, and, so, and so my kids are now quarter Asian. So my partner, Charlie, as described in the book, is from Chicago, Illinois, from Evanston. And there's a really interesting Midwestern thing from Evanston. We went, we ended up at Burning Man 12 years ago and sat in the central Burning Man fire where they light the Burning Man every night. And like four of the dudes sitting around there were from Evanston, Illinois. Oh, weird. I'm just saying, I'm yeah. just saying, there's something about that pocket, that suburban pocket of the Midwest that bred these young men. And as I like to say in the book, you know, Cheryl Sandberg is lean in. These dudes are lean out in a tinfoil hat, holding a Sun Ra record on vinyl <laughs> and sort of cannabis edibles. So to a certain extent, there's been an interesting thing of maleness, which I can't speak to because I'm not a male, but of like fall of kind of like, like the grandfather was the CEO of Sealy or Simmons Mattress. Father started barbecuing sons go to Columbia in in the 70s where you could get in with a C average mysteriously and kind of like fake your AP English like, and study Japanese horticulture and statuary and gardening and like so so I think he is a, a character that is um there and you can see by it would be the many guitars you could see the there's a tambourine I don't know why there's you could just see by that this is this sort of house where things are falling down. So, so to a certain extent, and he was a theatrical producer. We were partners, business partners for many years. So he calls it making donuts. Uh -huh. so like make donuts. So, make donuts. So thus yeah. far, he's been, and he got to read it as he comes down in his goddess pants. Try your the donuts. a great <laughs> thing. <laughs> So he's been pretty tolerant thus far. Great, hooray, God bless him. Yeah. Um, no, and it seems like every bohemian bourgeois couple I know, the woman is holding the family and the house and the money together, and the man is either fabulous, fabulously eccentric or is doing something very prestigious that earns about 
twenty thousand dollars a year. But yet there's some sort of disconnect. That much? Yeah. That much? <laughs> right. Or there's kind of elaborate New York Times recipes, like I've seen, like Conchinita Pibil, which is like a pig in banana leaves in the yard and it takes like and i've seen more than one wasp guy of a certain age try to cook this although i will note in your background i see there's a little ipod dock but it's very charming oh yeah that's and that's something that greg uh brought to the relationship you yeah. see you see yeah. the artisanal things these yeah. are yeah beautiful and god uh, god bless him yeah. Um, but we skew, a, we're really good on music. We, skew, we differ a little bit on movies that, I, that I'll go in a, in a slightly more traditionally female. I'm very comfortable with Judy Dench. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, no, no. Movie. And the, the Magnolia Hotels, it's kind of like, why are yeah, there of them? Love and, it. But I'm Greg there. is a little more adventurous, are you saying? Uh, yeah, and even skewing to the um, the karate type and the Van Damme, yeah, action stuff. Oh my God, that's very so, interesting. Well, maybe yeah. My partner. So even amongst the gays, there's there is cultural dissonance. Van Damage. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever happened to him? Precisely. Well, um, let's take another question, uh, buddy. Did he? Did he? Your last book about menopause, The Mad Woman in the Volvo, contained a trove of research. Are you taking a break from journalism in the new book? What, which kind of book do you prefer to write? One filled with research or one with personal essays? Well, the answer to that is very easy. Yeah, I, I research, uh, I mean, I, I, it's interesting to read, read I'm, I'm really fascinated in that. I do the lowdown on Sanchez, it's like this syndicated radio minute that um, that actually UCI grad students um, research and write. We've been doing it for 16 years. Um, I, I think I would prefer to write personal stories. And I, I, I think um, in The Mad Woman, the Volvo, it just seemed such an important topic of that time. And it hadn't really been much written about, even though menopause is a huge thing that affects like so many women, it's it's sort of the science of it is not really talked about that much. Or if it is, it's in one of those books that has a you know a flower and a stethoscope on the cover. <laughs> like, so it's nice to get some information in there reading it. But I, I think in, in the end, um, yeah, I, I, and I think particularly with the menopause book, I just found that um, it, it's such a huge emotional topic. And then to get kind of the advice to just you know, no caffeine, no alcohol, no sugar, that is really not very useful. Yeah. <laughs> right. just, okay. So, so I think coming at it from a personal point of view is, is a more helpful way, but yeah, that's a great question, but I would certainly just want to write out of personal experience for sure. Right. Although it seems to me that your best work, you're doing both. I mean, like right. those reviews in the Atlantic, it, they would start, very personal and small and then we would we would pull out and yeah we would get the larger picture so yeah and i, I yeah. no I, I i think you're right and that's really useful and i think particularly where women are concerned and i, th I think because there isn't for instance like there is not that much known about women's health as compared to men's health just because it's a lot more complicated and a lot more of the research has been done on men so i think that women are complicated um scientifically and biologically and emotionally and hormonally and these are all kind of part of the same fabric so 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 yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna agree with you henry that um and i think to a certain extent this book although it feels um personal like it, it but there are a lot of changes that have happened in the last 50 years and i think that underlying this book is a real economic conversation about, I call it first world taste on a third world budget, but what does it mean when people go to the farmer's market and buy locally grown, organically farmed uh, kale to bring home, even though they can't really afford it really, and the, it rots in their fridge, and what are they doing? I mean, to a certain extent, and of course, if you would look in our home, see those shares back there? Seven dollars, yeah. seven dollar, seven dollar. That's very <laughs> strange, my knees. So, Seven dollar, Henry, uh, like from Coco's Family Restaurant. I dragged them in my car. The massage chair was more. So, so in fact, underlying this book are a lot of financial calculations, and it's a constant under 
under running thing in the book. Cool. Which I don't really super highlight to say, and this is how much this cost or that's how much that cost. I mean, I think of like, uh, what is it? Douglas Coupland's, am I saying that right? Copeland, I think. Yeah, yeah, and Douglas Copeland of, of kind of like of uh, the, not the X generation, the cubicle people. There was much more of a conversation about what things cost. And I think that is an underlying thing in this book as well. Yeah. Um, one last question, and only because you've thrown it in our faces. I notice that Friar's guitars are just four feet away from Sandra's massage chair. Is that, um, do you guys ever do them simultaneously? Is, is the fact that they are right, basically right cheek by jowl, is that on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> but this is the new Zoom thing. It's kind of like a clue mystery thing. And, and what is that tomahawk doing in the corner? And is that a dead body? That is like really great. No, I think that's kind of like the, if you could look, let me see if I can like tilt. I love this. So there's the piano, there's a Zulu coconut from no no that's a that's a globe so no this is just kind of that we never figured out we live in as described in the book a a large craft fake craftsman home that is based on Ohio homes in Pasadena that I only was able to buy as per the financial calculations of the Northridge earthquake in LA brought home prices down in the, I think it was the 80s, 90s, so that I was able to get a small house in Van Nuys for a low amount of money that then went up. So this is parlaying of real estate. Um, and, but we, because it has a lot large, large public rooms and no nook to do anything. So that's why every room is just filled with stuff because we haven't figured it out. Nookless, nookless in Pasadena. <laughs> Yes, yes. So that's what you're seeing there. Yeah. All right. Hey, this was so fun. Thank you so much. Um, did, was there anything that we didn't talk about that you were hoping to? Yes. Like? Three words. Danskin, crotch, panel. <laughs> Not, to, and that's okay. We can let them learn, but we have known each other for so many years and we have reverberated and we have traded phrases back and forth. And I, I just feel that there are thoughts that I have had and written and only realized a couple of years later, it's like, I think I stole that from one of Henry Alfred's books. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to apologize for that because we have no. so many things that connect and, and sort of the dance can crotch panel thing. And I go- Two way, I, two way I, train, I have baby. used that and I think I stole it from you. So I just want to apologize <laughs> and I would like you to go legally on record to say that you will not sue me. I think, I think we have released the phrase dance can crotch panel into the to world. To the world. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's anyone's. <laughs> That's that. That's it. I think. I think one can't really go farther than that. Yeah. That's no. That's the no. Niplu Ultra. Absolutely. <laughs> um, the book is so fabulous, and this was such an honor to talk to you. I'm. I'm, and I'm really thrilled for all your success. But the other thing that I, I will say is that one day we will dance again in this living room, and you will wear the faux white fur as for like the, like the goddess pants and the fur. We will dance to David Bowie's fame in this living room like we have before as per your book, you know, and then we dance. So, so we've had so many good times together and we will again. Hooray! And now we do 20 minutes of... <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>